Thank God that there is a model church here in Revelation chapter 3. It is much different in every way to the Laodicean church. There is absolutely no resemblance between this church and the Laodicean church. They are as different as night is from day. This church called the Philadelphian church. How quickly a church can change from one generation to the next. You have the Philadelphian church, and we're going to go through that here in just a second. And the next church is a complete and an utter apostasy and a, an utter rebellion to the things of God. How quickly the church can change. How quickly people have changed in just one generation. Why don't you talk to some old folks and see how much has changed? Tammy was telling me about a conversation that she had with Alyssa's piano teacher. Alyssa's piano teacher, I think, is 80 years old or so. She's up in age. She's an old-time Lutheran. I think she's a Lutheran and a Presbyterian. I don't know how you do that, but she did it, amen. <laughs> she was having a conversation with my wife, and she was talking about how Morningside College, that's a Methodist college, am I correct? It's a Methodist college now allows homosexuals mm -hmm. to teach at the school to be on faculty. Here's this 80-year-old woman. She's a piano teacher. You know, what does she know? She knows more than all the faculty and staff over that college. Amen. Amen. How did she figure that out? You know what she said? She said, I wouldn't let my kids uh, sit under them. I wouldn't let them teach my children. Amen. Amen. How'd she figure that out? The church has gone into complete and utter apostasy. It's gone. But I believe, and because I know God, and I know that God is still merciful, He's still gracious, I still believe that there's a way back. There's a way back. There's a way back from Laodicea and it leads back to the church of Philadelphia. That's what I've entitled this sermon, The Way Back to Philadelphia. Now Laodicea is the last church, am I correct? So the only way to get back to Philadelphia is to turn around, correct? It's to repent. That's where it begins. That's where it always begins in the Bible. It begins for, with you turning away from your ways and your sin and your flesh and turning back to God. If any church in this world wants to get back to Philadelphia, the first thing they must do is turn around. They must repent. They must acknowledge that the way that they've been going is wrong. And I know that's going to be difficult because the pride of man is strong. But they must acknowledge that their ways are wrong, the way that their church is going is wrong, and they must turn around and go back. It's repentance. Amen. I believe all churches can travel back down this road if they just turn around. This road is found here in two verses. In Revelation chapter 3 and verse 7 and 8. Two verses. And to the angel of the church in Philadelphia write, These things saith he that is holy, he that is true, he that hath the key of David, he that openeth and no man shutteth, and shutteth and no man openeth. I know thy works. Behold, I have set before thee an open door, and no man can shut it, for thou hast a little strength, and hast kept my word, and hast not denied my name. There's a way back. I believe it begins with turning around. It begins with repentance. And the next thing I see here is in the name Philadelphia. What does the name Philadelphia mean? It means brotherly love. It means love. The way back from Laodicea to Philadelphia begins with repentance and then leads to love. You say, well, some of you might be thinking, well, these churches out here, they love people and they do a lot of things for people, and that's great, amen. But you know what? There's an order to God's love. 
Jesus gave two commandments. He gave first to love the Lord thy God with all thy heart, strength, soul, and mind. Then love thy neighbor as thyself. You see, the Laodicean church, sure they love people, amen. That's why the people flock to the churches. Because they have a need and the church meets their need. And the church is more interested in meeting the needs of the people than loving God. There's an order here. I want you to turn and see these two verses. It's just a few books back over. 1 John chapter 1. 1 John chapter 5, I'm sorry. 1 John chapter 5. I believe the Laodicean church has reversed the order. I believe the Laodicean church has adopted the philosophies of this world. Does not the United Way do some good things for people, don't they? And they spend a lot of money. And they help a lot of people's uh, fleshly needs. They do that. And I'm thankful for groups like that. Does not the Shriners and some of these other do-good uh, institutions, do they not help many people? But you see, the church first and foremost is to love God. Amen. And I'm going to show you right here in 1 John chapter 5, if you don't love God, you can't love anybody. That's right. That's what this is Bible, okay? This is Bible. 1 John 5 and verse 2. By this we know that we love the children when we love God and keep His commandments. Look at verse 3. For this is the love of God. You want to know what the love of God is? That we keep His commandments. This we know that we love the children when we love Love God. Man cannot properly love mankind until they first have a love for the Creator, for God Himself. Do you know who wrote this book? It was John the Beloved. John the Beloved was the one that laid his head on the, on the bosom of the Savior. John the Beloved heard the heartbeat of God. If anybody knew any more about the love of God, it was John. And John said here, you've got to love God first in order to love others. That's why Jesus made the, gave the two commandments to love the Lord thy God first. First and foremost is to love God. And to keep His commandments. This road leading back to Philadelphia begins with repentance and then leads to love of the love of God. Jesus talked about this religious crowd, these Pharisees, that profess to know God. You know what he said in John chapter 12 and verse 42? Listen to this. Nevertheless, among the chief rulers also many believed on him. Do you see that? They believed on Him. But because of the Pharisees, they did not confess Him lest they should be put out of the synagogue, for they loved the praise of men more than the praise of God. It said the chief rulers believed on Christ. But you know what they lacked? They didn't confess Him because they loved the praise of men more than the praise of God. Let me ask you a question. Did they love Christ or didn't they? They believed on Him, right? They may have spoken of Christ in secret inner circles, correct? But they would not confess Him because they loved the praise of men more than the praise of God. You tell me, did they love Christ or not? I say they did not love Christ. For those that love Christ will confess Christ. Amen. Jesus said, if you love me, keep my commandments. The first and great commandment is to love God and to love your neighbor. You know how you love your neighbor? You tell them about Jesus. Amen. Let's look in verse 8 in Revelation. Back in verse 8. We see repentance. We see the love for God. And the next thing I see here in verse 8, it says, I know thy works. The church wants to get back to Philadelphia and leave Laodicea. They must acknowledge the greatness of God. You say, where do you see the greatness of God? I see it in those four words. God says, I know thy works. 
Is the God that you claim to love and serve the God that has full knowledge of your works? Does your life reflect the fact that God watches your every move? Does your life reflect the fact that God is keeping a record of every thought and every idle word? He told this church in Philadelphia, I know thy works. And I believe this church in Philadelphia understood that and they believed that and they feared God and that helped them and that kept them. The God of the Philadelphian church is a personal God. God said, I know thy works. I believe this Philadelphian church acknowledged that God was all-knowing. They acknowledged that God was omnipresent. He was everywhere at all times. I believe they acknowledged that God was all-powerful. God said, I know thy works. Does your life reflect the fact that the eyes of the Lord are in every place beholding the good and the evil? Acknowledge the all-powerful power, God. Let's read verses 8 again. The next thing I see, I know thy works. Behold, I have set thee an open door. An open door. This church of Philadelphia, spiritually speaking, represents the church that came out of the Great Reformation, the church of the 1500s to the 1900s, this great church that God opened a door. He swung a door wide open for the freedom to preach His Word. Amen. No other time in history has a door to preach the Word of God had been more open during this Philadelphian time frame, during this Philadelphian age. You say, what does an open door mean? All you have to do is compare Scripture with Scripture. Colossians 4 and verse 3 says this, that God would open unto us a door of utterance to speak the mysteries of Christ. Obviously, an open door has something to do with speaking the mysteries of Christ. Amen. In 1 Corinthians 16, it says, For a great door and effectual is opened unto me, and there are many adversaries. No doubt when the door opens up and the Christian walks through that door professing and proclaiming the mysteries of Christ, there's going to be great adversaries. In Acts chapter 14 it says this, Paul says, and, and how he, talking about the Lord, had opened the door of faith unto the Gentiles. Paul saw this open door in this church of the Philadelphian age, this church between the 1500s and the 1900s. This church saw this great wide open door, this freedom to preach the Word of God that they never had before. And they walked through this door and God granted faith to the Gentiles and multitudes were saved and great revival swept across this world. Amen. Like no other time period within the church age was this door more opened. God empowered and opened the door for all those willing to preach. As the dark ages came to a close, the church of Rome began to lose their grip on the people. This opened a door for men like Luther and Zwingli and Wycliffe and Huss and Tyndale and Whitfield and Bunyan and Edwards and Wesley to preach the gospel with freedom and with fervency. Amen. That's this Philadelphian church age. And that's where the Laodicean church has to get back to. But I believe that they can come back. They can turn around. They can love God. They can preach the Word of God. The door's still a little open. Amen. I know it's closing. The door on the, on the church age is closing soon. But I believe it's still open. One day, just as the door of Noah's ark closed, locking out all inhabitants to, of the world, dooming all inhabitants to the world, one day this door that's been opened to the church will close. That's why it talks about there in Revelation chapter 4, After this I looked, and behold, a door was opened in heaven. One day a door is going to be opened in heaven, and God's going to take the church and rapture the church, and that door is going to be closed, ushering in the great tribulation while we got the door open amen let's preach the gospel amen. 